learning assistance from Bridgewater State University. Uh, we run a program called PAL, so it stands for Peer Assisted Learning, and in our courses we uh, provide a small section. We teach about uh, five to ten students in each section, two to three times a week, every week for ten weeks, uh, and it's a supplement to their Comp 151 classes. Um, our program was provided by a NSF grant, uh, National Science Foundation, and it was, we packaged it into the Street Initiative. Street Initiative was something our scientists came up with to alleviate some of the tension and some of the lecture, 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 lecture assessment blocks of teaching science courses. And the experience for students to be able to do labs, make mistakes, and uh, learn as a group. Um, it is undergraduate-led. There are no graduate facilitators. We are all undergraduate uh, student facilitators of these sections. And it facilitates a, only the introductory level courses. So we don't have one for our comp side two. We only have one for our comp side one, uh, one for doing courses in job. Uh, this is the main thesis statement of the Strings Initiative. Uh, we were actually unaware when we started this program. We kind of did it uh, bottom up. We said, there's a problem with the way we're teaching PAL. We are just facilitating a lecture and not giving student uh, initiative. Is there something better we can do? So we formulated what we handed out to you, an outline of our uh, ideals. And it turns out that that matched the original intention of the program to begin with. And we just never got the memo. So uh, we kind of worked our way to an inquiry-based learning that's student-focused, not material-focused, not lecture-focused. Um, and you can read that there. Uh, but it, the main, main portion of that is inquiry-based learning. Um, so now we're trying to fulfill the proposal. Um, computer science labs are heavy, heavy laden with things that are pitfalls for starting programmers that we take for granted. Jargon, uh, being new to the material, and even the fact that a lot of our 151 courses are taught in math, critical justice, and other non-majors. So when you have a comp sci major that uh, does real well, and you have someone that's struggling, how do you make a plan that catches them all in and gets them all engaged, and especially gets them working with each other. Um, um, so students come into our labs already like with the abilities to do their homework, but they can't really think beyond that. And so what we're trying to do is get them out of the habit of being worried about making mistakes, exploring, and playing with the code. So we want to go into their comfort zones rather than uh, get them out of their comfort zones. So we try to push out those borders and make them comfortable learning with us. Um, we try to use concepts that connect with them, like pets, uh, box office data, anything that relates to their world instead of abstract concepts like bank accounts. Um, so we, we look at them first when we make our examples for questions, and not the textbook. And then we relate afterwards to the textbook. Um, this allows us to breach the cloud of confusion that they have. Um, so translating the code to their language helps us teach them the correct terms in their own language. And this increases the confidence in the interactiveness uh, of the students and the inquisition. Um, so the warm-ups are questions based on the terms and concepts from the chapters, and they're directly connected to the students' own knowledge that they currently have. Um, sometimes we'll have to connect that throughout the lab, like with classes. We gave them general questions with methods and classes, and we showed them like a method header, and they were pretty lost with it. And after walking them through the lab, they were actually able to tell me what a method was, how to use a access a method, how to use a mutator method. Um, so we, we try to focus on structure and syntax, such as a what, what is a variable, what is a literal, um, what's the difference between public and private, different terms. Um, we'll, we'll ask them to randomly come up to the board and write out the answer to these problems. And this gets them up and moving. And they, they seem to actually answer questions and get involved. They actually talk and think about the code uh, when you're actually getting them involved and not just handing them a lab to work on. And so it's a big plus at making the learning memorable. Um, they, they seem to remember the whole lab for the next lesson, whereas they were forgetting it in the previous uh, semesters. So, we, so the, the class 
the class teaching that we were in now is using pets. And so we asked them questions about what a pet has. It has a name, a species. We have them describe it. And after, after they did that, we told them how they can connect that to the programming. And the students were surprised how easy it was to connect it in this way, rather than seeing a slideshow of all the different uh, classes and methods, uh, syntax. They didn't really understand that. So getting them to talk about code is a big deal. And having them recognize that this thing they don't understand is another big deal with this uh, whole program we're doing. And so we, we have them ask questions on our website. It's a required thing weekly. Um, we're actually trying to build them a study guide for their tests coming up, too. So it's a win-win for them. And these, these questions can be from a class discussion that they didn't understand. It can be just a general term that they don't understand. Or even advanced topics. If they want to make games, we'll talk to them about making games. We'll post a link. Um, we really just want to them talking about code, interested in code, and show them that they can do it. So by connecting it to their world, it's really easy to do this. So when we try and get them to ask these questions, sometimes they lose the focus of where the questions stand. And so when you go through a typical book lab that we've been parsing through to try and get materials, uh, we'll have a huge problem with the difference between, it's a subtle difference between make a bank account that has, and then the question, what does a bank account have? The first is a close that has a written answer that's very pragmatic, and you don't actually have to think about why you're doing what you're doing. As opposed to our open forum, which is the best thing with these small groups, where we're trying to get them to design first and code later. Uh, a lot of times we like to jump, jump right into syntax, but sometimes it takes a good example for them to get a fuller understanding that they can then discuss and expand upon. Um, there's when we were researching previous PAL students and said, what went wrong? Where did you lose? Turns out the biggest complaint was chapter three in early objects. We teach primitive types, and then we jump right into objects. We don't do it then the end. So they don't see a purpose. They don't see a purpose with, my, I made a cat. Or in their case, I made a bank account, but my bank account just gets a value and sets a value. I don't get to do any logic. Why did I make a bank account? And so that's really discouraging. So we're trying to not change the template of how the course is taught, but as um, support how the course is taught, and support early objects the best we can. And the best way we found of doing that was to add all the benefits of having a peer-to-peer -peer relationship. Um, so we picked out a couple of things to focus on, but the main thing was that they have to be able to frame what you're asking them and what you want them to do. In procedural instruction sets of how to do this lab, do this, do this, do this. By the time they get to step five, they don't know, and they get an error because it's the first time they've compiled. They don't remember where the error was, and then they let Eclipse help them, and then you have everything everywhere. And they didn't realize that they just forgot a semicolon in step one. No assessment. A lot of times in their classes, they don't get assessed until we came. So we try and give them that feedback so that if they can discuss it with us, they must be able to understand it. Can't discuss it with us, then their code will be compiled. Here's my model. Um, if I ask you all right now, what's a bank account have? It's an abstract question. But if I ask you, describe to me your pet in words, you'd be able to answer that, right? Someone tell me what their pet, what uh, something about their pet. Someone raise their hand and tell me something about their pet right now. Breed. Breed. So you gave me. Did you give me a type or did you give me a value? These are the types of questions I want you to think about. Give me a type, right? right. A variable type? Because right. yeah. your, your breed may be a Great Dane, if it's your pet's a dog. Mine may be a uh, Cheshire cat. It's a cat. These are the types of things. And then they have something concrete to hold on to. You see, we kind of get the, the left is a tangible object, the right is like board work, paper work, coding first. And we assess coding on paper. Most colleges assess written tests. So why practice in an editor and then assess on paper? Um, this is just the outline of how we actually do it. We have a discussion about it. We then have to relate that back to the warm-up terms, and then finally we actually have them concretely code. 
So one of the other things we need to do is strike a balance between training self-sufficient programmers and um, and get, and getting them to work in groups and, and behave in groups. So we have this lab format, and um, everyone, nobody can uh, memorize a whole reference book or a whole API. So uh, we, so we need to get them talking to each other and using each other's resources. Um, you know, traditional programming assignments, everybody's at a computer, just the nature of computer science is such that you're tuning the rest of the world out. And we want to get them out of that comfort zone, get them out of that, uh, you know, that shallow vision. Um, and so, that, so that's basically the balance we want to strike. Um, does anybody know why Socrates was the wisest man in all of Athens? It's a philosophy 101. Yep. He knew that he did not know. Yes, that's right. Uh, he knew that he did not know. So one of the big problems is students don't know what they don't know. So um, a lot of times I'll ask a student, what do you need help with? What's the problem in the assignment? And they can't formulate that. And getting them to formulate that is part of the process. Because a lot of times, even at my level, um, just talking about the problems of these guys will help me solve the problem. And I'll hear myself solving it as I'm talking about it. So figuring out what the problem is, and this will get them to learn to speak jargon too. Oh, and, uh, and style matters. Style's a bigger thing than you realize. You know, code has structure to it. Um, so we really want to bring out that structure when we give them sample code and when we give them uh, template code. Um, so structured code, we think, leads to structured learning. And you don't want to, we don't want to over comment because a lot of times reading comment can be a substitute for actually reading the code and learning to read the code. Um, and conventions have help recognition. You learn to teach conventions early. That way they learn to use them themselves, like camel case. Um, and it, they'll, it'll help them recognize the difference between a class and a method and a variable. Um, so small victories are important. You know, all big problems can be broken up into small problems. So if they learn to solve the small problems, then they learn to put the blocks together later on. So you know, we should emphasize those small victories, and uh, it'll build confidence. And uh, when we're speaking to students, we should always be logical, because computer languages are logical languages, and we should speak in logical terms, and uh, you know, model our language off model our English language off the computer language when we're teaching. And uh, always show the resources. Uh, so give students the tools rather than the answers. Uh, lead them to the tools. Get them to know how to search for things on their own and find things on their own. Uh, and that's about it. Thank you for a long time. Uh, so these are our resources. We have a website. Uh, so you can download our lessons, our lesson plans. Um, we wanted to say thank you to the PAL uh, administration and our professors and everybody else who helped on this and uh, we'll take any questions that you might have. Yes. So do you have any data about the impact that the changes, the changes you've made in the class have had on retention and grades, et cetera, et cetera? We're only in the stage where we're analyzing the problem. Uh, for the last two years, we've had a, consent, uh, a, a weird trend where computer science, after initializing PAL, has been the only uh, major to not improve its DFWIs, its D's, F's, withdrawals, and incompletes. Um, most of the other majors have had steady growth and steady increase, uh, except for the ones that only have like maybe 10 majors. We're not a very, we're a liberal arts school, so our science department's quite small, but um, in our case, it'd be like one semester, 15 entry, uh, 30 entries, 15 retention. Um, next semester, 45 entries, 15 retention. Next semester, 60 entries, 15 retention. And the biggest issue we found was that no one was analyzing the problem. So to answer your question, by this stage, we've analyzed the problem, we figured out where in the book and where in the teaching style, and, ha and so this semester is our first run. Uh, we're only four lessons in <laughs> to our first run of this uh, I really like your pet example, and I like the distinction between types and values, and it's leading me to wonder, what are the methods for your pet class? Do they bark? Um, 
So I'll let them answer as well uh, for this because we each have different styles of how we implement. In my sections, I let my students tell me what a pet should do. And what and I just want them to know that their pet and the other person's pet has to be able to do the same type of thing. So the methods of an animal, we can assume, hopefully, their pet can make noise. But then when the specific noise value, maybe a string that they make, when you make your object, I make my object, your pet barks, my pet meows, um, but I make them tell them, I don't tell them. Uh, I just gave you guidelines for mine that they had to have a boolean, a string, and an end. And basically, my pets were dragons that were flying and swimming around. Um, that's all our pets really did. Um, they switched the boolean values and gave the name back. Uh, one of the th other things we're working on is a graphical program where students can import their individual pets into the program. So we have some standard methods that they're going to use. Like, uh, so if the pet is poor, then you can entertain your pet. <laughs> um, <and so, laughs> uh, or if the pet is hungry, feed your pet. So we're going to have a few methods that everyone's going to implement because those ones are going to be the ones that will be the standard ones for our graphical game when it's done. And that's a surprise. The students don't know that yet. So. Any other questions? Yes. I'm curious. Are are you implementing this? In, uh, are you uh, working in conjuncture? I'm not sure if that's the right word. With the professors, or is this like a standalone? Uh... Uh, we've been working in conjunction. We meet once a week with the professors, and we go over the labs and they have access to the websites. They have given us our, their comments on it, and uh, yeah, they've given us a lot of direction. We based the labs of their previous labs, but we told them the problem because they don't see it as much as we do. In the labs, we presented the problem to them and, uh, you know, so, and the symptoms of the problem, so, yeah, we do work with them. Just to add to that, we, uh, the labs we do in our format is, was of our design um, because, you know, the approval process for a lesson plan is quite large, so it's, we just did make one, made that design we handed out to you and said, do you like this? We'll make it. And uh, that has gotten better results than going through the process of asking. <laughs> <laughs> one more question. Um, would it be possible for us to, let's say, uh, in my college or my university, would it be possible for us to, to some degree, emulate what you're doing? And like, how would we go around doing that? So you see what we handed out, we handed out the template and the goals of what each section was. Um, so ours is just kind of a proto, you know, you could even think of it as a protocol for what a good lesson is. Uh, the PAL program website that we have for Bridgewater State emulates kind of the format. So the just main goals is if you want to emulate what we do, it's a student-led section that the students attend to support the material that they get in the lecture class, where they have control but your facility, but the students uh, appear facilitates. And with the emphasis on them asking questions, their design, and their understanding, and not so much turning to a book. Is this required for all the students at the set time? Uh, so when yeah. they register for a course, they schedule it? Uh, for our computer science, it is scheduled. For other majors, it was up to the departments to individually implement that quote I had at the beginning, it was their job to implement that. So every part was different because comp size scheduling is always a nightmare. We, for us, we uh, made it a one credit course that they had to sign up. 